Our guest this weekend from Agora Financial is Jim Rickards, author of the great new book, The New Case for Gold. And he's here to talk to us about how gold relates to the current geopolitical environment, how it relates to Austrian economics and commodities, how countries actually fight currency wars instead of hot wars. And we'll even discuss whether Hillary will be indicted paving the way for a Biden Elizabeth Warren ticket. So if you're interested in gold and geopolitics, stay tuned for a great interview with Jim Rickards. So, Jim Rickards, good morning, and thanks so much for joining Mises Weekends. Good morning. I want to get into your new book, but but before we do so, I have to ask, I noticed recently that you placed a bet in a UK betting parlor uh, that Joe Biden would be the next president of the United States. So I got to ask what your thinking was there. Sure, uh, Jeff, that's uh, that's exactly right. I was in London recently doing the international uh, b- a part of uh, our global book tour for my new book, The New Case for Gold. We had done the um, U.S. launch on April 5th, and uh, that was very exciting. Had a book party in New York, then we went to London for the international launch. But, you know, in London, uh, they have a, a chain called Ladbrokes, uh, and they're they're almost on every street corner, not quite, but kind of like ATMs. You see them everywhere. And perfectly legal to uh, walk in and place a bet. And they'll make odds on almost anything. They have, you know, obviously sporting events and certain news items posted, but you can just walk up to a counter and uh, give them a bet, and they'll look up, look it up online and give you odds. And so I, I placed uh, 20 pounds sterling, 20 quid, on Joe Biden to be president. I got 100 to 1 odds, so if mm. I win, that'll pay me uh, 2,000 pounds, which is worth a little, a little less than $3,000. I'll go back to collect. But, of course, uh, the point is what was my thinking. I do expect... Um, that uh, Hillary Clinton will face criminal charges sooner than later uh, based on misuse of classified information and perhaps official corruption in her role as Secretary of State. Uh, one of the reasons this FBI investigation is taking so long is because they've, they've gone beyond just the, uh, the server and the email uh, and are looking in, into other allegations involving um, uh, you know, basically contributions to the Clinton Foundation in exchange for official action by the State Department, which is a, a backdoor form of bribery. So I'll leave it to the uh, to the FBI to sort that out. But uh, based on my own, uh, I, I am a lawyer. Um, I've done quite a few uh, government enforcement cases. Um, I have a background in national security as well. So probably have more uh, kind of hands on insights into the issues involved here than uh, let's say the the everyday reader of uh, uh, you know, newspapers or websites or someone who's following this, uh, and it it seems that she is in some uh, some jeopardy here, and it'll probably play out in drips. Meaning, we'll hear about Huma Abedin, we'll hear about Cheryl Mills, we'll hear about Jake Sullivan, other close advisors. Perhaps they're taking the Fifth Amendment. The FBI has been pretty tight lipped on this. Uh, to the point where uh, uh, James Comey, the director of the FBI, has even said he'll uh, put his own FBI agents in under lie detector tests, which is not unusual, by the way, when you have uh, uh, security clearances and the uh, certainly uh, some or all of the FBI agents involved in this would have um, you know, top secret or higher security clearances uh, to take polygraph tests if they if someone's trying to run down a leak. So the FBI has been pretty tight lipped. There have been a few leaks some reporting on this, but it does seem that this is all converging. Now, politically, the Democrats, of course, are as fearful of Bernie Sanders as the Republicans are of Donald Trump. Uh, We don't have to get into the whole Trump phenomenon. Clearly, Trump will be the Republican nominee, but it's fair to say a lot of Republicans not too happy about that. But over on the Democratic side, if if Clinton becomes non-viable because of the uh, criminal charges I've described, and if the party establishment doesn't want Sanders because he would be likely to lose in November, they may just pivot to Biden. I'm I'm not saying Biden's going to throw his hat on the ring. I'm saying the party may turn to him at a late stage, uh, at which point he could even um, go so far as to pick Elizabeth Warren as his running mate. That would satisfy um, certainly women who were upset that Hillary wasn't at the top of the ticket and also progressives who were upset that Bernie Sanders wasn't on the ticket. So uh, Elizabeth Warren would go a long way to satisfying women and progressives. And of course, Joe Biden's a very likable candidate. And he's, he's already said in an earlier interview, different context, that he would only be a one-term president. Uh, so, uh, you know, it could be setting up for one Biden term, two Warren terms, who knows. Uh, anyway, it seemed like an interesting uh, punt, as they say in uh, the UK. We'll see how it plays out. 
Well, that'd be a nice little three thousand dollar payday if you're right. But it would uh, be. <laughs> we could talk about Hillary all day long. But I want to get to your book. It's called The New Case for Gold, put out by Penguin now in 2016. Uh, I guess first and foremost, you're writing a book about gold doesn't necessarily make you popular in book circles. I notice in the introduction you do give a nod to Carl Menger. Tell us, for our audience's sake, to what extent the Austrian viewpoint on money I- influences you uh, in terms of gold and your own writing. Sure, Jeff. Be glad to do that. But just on your first point, uh, it's it's interesting. I think it's fair to say that uh, quite a few people in publishing, book publishing, magazine publishing, particularly New York circles, are fairly liberal. But they love conservative authors. Their conservative books sell Hmm. way more than liberal books. So uh, there's sort of a marriage of convenience there. Uh, But I have to say my publisher, uh, uh, the portfolio imprint of uh, Penguin, have been extremely supportive of this project from the start. I wasn't sure they would like it. They, they published my earlier books, uh, Currency Wars and the Death of Money. I wasn't sure they would go for a book on gold, but it, it turns out that they love it. They think it's a book that's going to just sell and sell and sell. And it has sold well. We've, uh, we're a national bestseller, um, ranked number six on the Wall Street Journal hardcover business uh, bestseller list, uh, over 50,000 copies sold in, in a month, which is, uh, if you know anything about the book business, that's a lot. So we're off to a great start. But uh, particularly with with reference to Carl Menger, what I did in the book, uh, it's called the, the New Case for Gold, but there are certain arguments against gold that you hear over and over again, and they just do not hold water. And I was actually tired of hearing them. I said, well, before I can go on for the reader, uh, about why they should have gold in their portfolios. I have to shoot down these arguments because you know you go to a cocktail party or you go on, you know, certain, in my case, on TV or at a public event, you say something positive about gold, you immediately get these pushback arguments. I call them robo-responses. People say, um, you know, gold has no yield. There's not enough gold in the world to support uh, commerce. Gold mining output doesn't grow fast enough to support the world growth trade. By the way, none of these arguments hold water. And I explain this in the book. I just take them one by one and shoot them down. But the one that uh, struck me and, and that you're referring to with regard to uh, Menger and Austrian economics is people say gold has no intrinsic value. They'll, they'll look at a piece of gold. They say, well, just stock in a company, you know, the company's worth something or a bond, uh, you know, is going to pay you off a stream of cash flow. So that has uh, uh, a machine or a car, anything has some intrinsic value, but gold has no intrinsic value. You hear people say it's just a, uh, a pile of shiny rocks. Of course, it's not a rock, it's a metal. So they get that wrong too. But uh, And my answer to that is um, congratulations on your firm grasp of Marxian economics, because the theory of intrinsic value as a way to come up with the value of anything has been discredited, not not well regarded by economists since Carl Menger shot it down in 1873. Now, intrinsic value goes back to David Ricardo. Uh, you know, now we're talking about the early 19th century and the issue was, well, you know, what's something worth? This is when market economics were in, in the very early days, not that long uh, after Adam Smith's uh, The Wealth of Nation uh, from 1776. So Ricardo said, well, think about the inputs, think about the labor and the capital that went into it, that's a measure of what something is worth. And that's what he meant by uh, intrinsic value. And it was also called the uh, uh, the labor theory of value, like how much went into it. Well, Karl, Mar- Karl Marx took David Ricardo and to, in Das Kapital and took it a step further. And he said, well, yes, uh, that's the right way to think about it. But we have labor inputs and capital inputs, and capital controls the means of production and doesn't give labor their fair share. So Marx's theory was that, um, yeah, there's a labor input that adds value to goods, but labor only gets paid a fraction of that. And the surplus labor theory, that was Marx's theory, went to the benefit of capitalists who controlled the means of production. That was unfair. That would lead to a proletariat revolution, et cetera, so that labor would get their fair share. Well, along comes Menger, uh, one of the fathers and founders of the Austrian School of Economics, and says, That's all nonsense. He says, sure, there are inputs into some, you can measure them, but that's not how we decide what things are worth. Uh, Menger advanced what's called the subjective theory of value based on utility. He said, everything, whether it's money or an object or any of the other things I mentioned, has some value to a consumer, to a user, based on their subjective um, uh, preference for, for that particular good or service. And they decide what that is. And of course, that's the foundation of market economics. Now, since then, 
uh, Menger's theory of subjective value has been the predominant uh, and best way of thinking about things in in economics. It's the foundation of market economics and really the foundation of all Austrian economics. Now, you can go on and on from there and to 20, 20th and 21st century economics, talk about market imperfections and government intervention. That debate still goes on. And of course, the Austrians are a big part of that. But, but Menger really overthrew Marx and overthrew Ricardo. So all I've done is taken what we just described uh, and applied it to gold and said, well, gold is money. Dollars are money, euros are money, Bitcoin is money. They're all forms of money. And if you want to know what gold is worth, just ask anyone who uses money. We all need money. So we have a subjective appraisal of what each kind of money is worth. And in a world where we have very high confidence in central bank money, we're confident in dollars and euros, gold might not be worth very much. But in a world where we start to lose confidence in central bank money, our subjective preference for gold as money would start to go up. And this is exactly what Menger would say. Menger would have said, okay, you've got six or seven or eight or a hundred kinds of money competing in the marketplace for the preferences of, of consumers uh, based on their assessment of utility. And if you think gold's a better form of money than paper dollars, and personally I do, then you're going to have a bid for gold and the dollar price of gold will go up. So, so I've basically demolished that intrinsic theory that you hear all the time. People just don't think about it. I, as I say, you, I, I congratulate them on being good Marxists and that catches them off guard. Uh, but I think Menger had it right. And I think uh, today, based on subjective utility, which is an Austrian concept, gold is coming into its own as a uh, preferred form of money. Let me ask you your view on this. We talk about gold as money, and Austrians also tend to talk about gold as a commodity. Some writers like Steve Forbes have proposed kind of an ersatz gold standard, but but with a fixed dollar gold ratio. Um, some of our own writers like David Gordon said, no, that's nonsense. Um, gold and the dollar should be allowed to float against each other um, in terms of price. Do you, do you have a sense whether, you, you know, do you view gold as, more as money or more as commodity? Uh, neither. I just think of gold as money, period, full stop. I don't think of gold as a commodity. And look, gold, and there's a reason for that. Now, gold is dug up out of the ground. You need a mining industry and capital investment and geology and surveys and a lot of other things to find gold. Uh, and it, that uh, it is quite scarce, which is just an interesting attribute uh, if you're thinking about gold as money. And it does trade on commodity exchanges and the commodities reporters, you know, breathlessly report the price on TV. So I understand all that. Uh, but it's it doesn't really meet the definition of a commodity. And, and the reason is the definition of a commodity, it's, uh, it's a, a commodity is a fairly generic or uh, uniform input that goes into the creation and manufacturing of other things. So for example, copper is an input in uh, pipes and, and, uh, and construction. Uh, steel is an input in manufacturing and construction, uh, you know, et cetera. You can go on and on. Coal is an input in energy production. Go through all the commodities. Corn is food. Uh, you know, cotton goes into clothing. All the other commodities go into something else. Gold is not really good for anything. Gold is not used for anything except money and a store of wealth, which is part of the definition of money. Now, people look at the jewelry industry, but I, I consider jewelry to be wearable wealth. Okay, it's decorative and it's pretty. I understand all that. But if you talk to an Indian bride with, you know, three pounds of gold draped around her neck in the form of gold necklaces, she'll tell you that's her wealth. That's her bank account. That's her IRA. That's going to put her th kids through college or pay for her house. And so that's that's how they think about it, and that is the right way to think about it. So gold is not a commodity because it's not an input. It's not really useful, but it's a great form of money. So I do think of gold uh, as money. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I, I am a, a big admirer and student of Austrian economics. I think Austrian economics has a lot to offer, but I don't consider myself a pure Austrian. Uh, I'm certainly not a Keynesian or a monetarist. Uh, I'm a... Uh, uh, more in the historical school of economics, if you want to categorize it, which was also, I would say, Joseph uh, Schumpeter and, and Karl Marx were both in the historical school. It doesn't mean I agree with Marx. I, it just means that that we we all think of large historical forces that tend over time to uh, dominate the evolution of, uh, of uh, economic systems. Uh, but I'm also a complexity theorist. I'm using a lot of late 20th and early 21st century science coming out of physics, applied mathematics, network theory, um, and also behavioral psychology 
And I used a very old mathematical formulation uh, known as the causal inference inverse probability. Uh, also goes by the name Bayes' theorem. So I would say I'm a, a complexity theorist, a Bayesian, and a behavioralist. Those are the three tools that I use plus history. So I'm an historicist also uh, to understand economic systems. So again, Austrians have a lot to offer, and I am an admirer. But uh, I, I like to say if uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises were alive today, he'd be a complexity theorist. Well, that's why we interview you, Jim, because you're an interesting guy, not because you're 100 percent in one camp or another. I want to bring up a sentence you wrote in a recent article, and it really it really goes to everything that's in your book. You wrote, for a century, elites have worked to eliminate gold, monetary gold, both physically and ideologically. So given that reality, talk to us about how we might start to get central banks to consider gold again. Well, um, that's right. Again, going back to what I said earlier about these arguments uh, against gold that I shoot down in my book, I may shoot them down, but you still hear them. You you hear them from scholars. You hear them. It's not just sort of the everyday citizen is repeating something they may have picked up. I mean, you hear PhDs. You hear um, you know prominent uh, public officials. Uh, certainly, television personalities now that's repeating these things. And I say to myself, well, where did they get this? And I know where they got it. Um, they got it from from the elites who like the central bank system. And think about it. If you were a PhD from MIT on the board of governors or maybe the chairman of uh, a central bank, why would you have anything good to say about gold? You control the printing press. You control money. Anyone who controls money controls politics, controls culture, controls the world to some extent. Uh, and certainly all these PhDs collectively. I mean, go around and look at the bios of the heads of all the major central banks. So Mario Draghi in uh, the European Central Bank, uh, Kuroda in the Bank of Japan, the head of the People's Bank of China. He said, well, gee, we got you know Italians and Germans and Japanese and Chinese. They all went to the same schools. They all went to either MIT or Harvard or the University of Chicago or, very, or Stanford, a very short list of schools. They had the same profession. In many cases, Stan Fisher, who's the vice chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, former head of the Central Bank of Israel, was for many years, a decades really, a professor at MIT who was the PhD thesis advisors for a lot of these other central bankers. So this is a very small club. They all, they were all taught the same thing. They all believe the same thing. And collectively, they control not just the dollar printing press, but all the printing presses in the world. Why on earth would they want to give up that power? So what's happened is since, uh, since gold was demonetized in the mid-1970s, so this is 45 years ago, 45 years is almost three generations. It's kind of two and a half generations. You have, you have a, let's just say, two generations plus of scholars and, who have never learned about gold. Um, I happen to be slightly older. I was, uh, I was at the tail end of that. I got a, a, my, a graduate degree in international economics, class of 1974. But in 72, 73, 74, when I was studying international economics, gold was still a reserve asset. It was a monetary asset. And we had to study gold as money. If you joined the IMF in the 1960s or early 70s, you had to pay for part of your IMF quota in gold. Uh, and so... I was the last class to really learn it in a monetary sense. I, I joke that if uh, if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because the university just stopped teaching it. So what we have is a conspiracy of ignorance, a conspiracy to not teach it, not discuss it, not take it seriously. The older scholars know better. I've spoken to Ben Bernanke about this. He, he understands it. He just won't say anything good about it for the reason I mentioned is he's one of the one of the guys with his hand on the printing press. But all the younger students and younger scholars have been greatly, I would say, disserved and disadvantaged by the fact that they have not had um, a good education uh, in gold. And what you get are these really propaganda points that Gold caused the Great Depression, which is not true. Uh, there's not enough gold in the world to support finance, which is not true. And again, we don't have enough time to go through all the explanations, but they're all in the book. Uh, in the introduction to the book, really, in, in just about 20 pages, I give uh, the readers you know, facts, figures, analysis. They can draw their own conclusions. Uh, I really wrote the book for educational reasons. I mean, I'm not a gold salesman. I don't get commissions. If you buy gold or don't buy gold, it doesn't uh, affect me one way or the other. But I do think it will affect you and your portfolio. And that's why I wrote the book really was to kind of fill in uh, the, this uh, missing, uh, missing link, if you will, in most people's monetary education. 
Jim, you mentioned your earlier book, Currency Wars. Talk a little bit about what currency wars are and what they really mean. How could a government engage in a currency war with another government? How does that work technically? Well, I would uh, separate two kinds of war, uh, currency war, which is what you're asking about, Jeff, and financial warfare. Um, a currency war is uh, is nasty business, but it's economic. It's You're not trying to destroy the other guy. You're trying to help yourself. Uh, currency wars arise in a situation when there's too much debt and not enough growth. Notice, how do you handle debt? Well, there are kind of three ways out. You can grow. You can actually grow and make enough money to pay the debt. Um, you can default, not pay the debt. Or you can inflate it, which is just a disguised form of default. So I inflate my currency. So I say, hey, Jeff, here's that uh, billion dollars I owe you. Good luck buying a loaf of bread because it's not worth very much. So growth, default, and inflation are the three ways out of debt. We're not getting growth. Uh, it'd be nice if we were, but we're not. This is the weakest expansion since a recession uh, in history. Um, I really regard the United States as having been in a depression defined as uh, actual growth below trend, um, i.e. an output gap uh, since 2007. I think the U.S. is Japan. Uh, by the way, I said that in uh, in 2011 in my book, Currency Wars, and I actually said it even earlier than that. Here we are five years later. Uh, none of the policymakers would have expected this kind of weak growth to persist this long. Um, but it's exactly what I was expecting because we made the same mistakes as Japan. Japan's had 30 years of on and off depression, uh, recession, and weak growth. The U.S. is now seven years into the same pattern. If we don't change, we're going to have wind up with 20 or 30 years of this. So, um, so that's the state of the world today, not enough growth. So that leaves the other two options, default and uh, inflation. Well, there's no reason to default. I mean, why would you? If you can print the money, why, why would you default? Just print the money. So we end up with inflation as the answer. But there's one problem. This is what I call Mick Jagger economics. You know, the Rolling Stones had a song, you can't always get what you want. And just because central banks want inflation doesn't mean they're going to get the inflation very easily because now we're into behavioral psychology and the fact that people don't want to print the money. This is the flaw with negative interest rates and helicopter money and all the things you hear about. You can drop money out of helicopters, but if people don't want to spend it, if they would prefer to reduce their balance sheets, pay off debts, pay off credit cards, student loans, car loans, house loans, et cetera, then you're not getting the velocity you need to create the inflation. So they're probably going to end up with governments, uh, which is, you know, goes by various names, but uh, uh, debt monetization or um, uh, Bernanke came up with a a funny name the other day, but ba basically it's it's all, you know, if people don't want to spend, the government's will, this will increase deficits, you cover the deficits with more government borrowing, and the central banks will print the money to buy the debt, which is debt monetization. So that's the the elite plan, but it's going to take, um, take a little while to uh, play out. In the meantime, I'm just watching this whole show saying, well, fine, I can't control the world, but I can't control my own portfolio, and um, converting central bank money, which goes by the name of dollars or euros, into um, uh, and gold is a way, in my view, to preserve wealth with this coming inflation. We haven't seen much inflation yet. That's true. But it's coming. Uh, the elites are working overtime to uh, uh, to produce it. Now, as far as uh, a gold standard is concerned, there, there's not a central bank in the world that wants a gold standard. You can be certain of that. My question is, are you at some point forced to go to a gold standard, not because you want to, but because you have to to restore confidence in some kind of, you know, collapse of confidence or systemic crisis, probably much worse than we saw uh, in 2008. And the answer is you might, um, you might have to do it just to, to put a lid on things if you don't reform the international monetary system sooner. So, so we're stuck in this weak growth cycle. Uh, the central banks want inflation; they're not getting it, but they're not going to give up because they can't give up. They have to keep trying. The inflation will come eventually, and. Uh, um, again, it, even before the inflation arrives, we're seeing lost confidence in uh, central bank money, and that's part of what's driving the price of gold higher. Now, so as now that's a currency war because uh, you try to cheapen your currency to import inflation, steal growth, steal inflation from the other guy. Financial war, which I think is kind of what you were getting at, Jeff, that is warfare. That is no different than dropping bombs or firing missiles at the enemy, except you're using financial weapons. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, sanctions, uh, you know, we kicked Iran out of the global payment system. Uh, they say we, meaning the United States. Um, we're putting financial sanctions on Russia. You know, Russia invades Crimea and Ukraine 
and we don't drop the 82nd Airborne into Sevastopol, Crimea. What we do is impose financial sanctions. That's an example of financial warfare. But there's something, uh, you know, I do um, quite a bit of consulting for the U.S. government, the intelligence community, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and others, and I've certainly spoken to the Treasury and the Fed and, and other agencies at different times. Um, and people say, well, what, what keeps them up at night? What is the deepest fear? And I think most listeners are very familiar with um, cyber warfare and cyber threats. A lot of them had to do with taking control of critical infrastructure. That could be the power grid. For example, you could take control of a hydroelectric dam, uh, open the floodgates and drown 200,000 people in their sleep who were kind of unsuspecting downstream. And suddenly the floods came because you opened up the dam, uh, shutting down the power grid. That's an easy um, and we're where financial warfare involving market manipulation, uh, et cetera, will combine those two, combine cyber and financial. Cyber financial warfare, that's the, the, the thing that uh, uh, our, our defense establishment fears the most. And the way you would do it, people imagine a first order effect of, you know, go in, shut down the New York Stock Exchange, which is easy to do, or, uh, you know, what's called distributed denial of service attacks where, you know, you flood JP Morgan's online banking system with so many, so much message traffic that it can't functions and people can't get to their accounts. Those things are, are trivial. Um, what's a lot more threatening is not that you would shut down a system, but that you would take over a system. You would get inside the order entry system or one of the stock exchanges and start uh, spoofing orders, uh, sell Google, sell Apple, sell Tesla, sell this, sell that. And the brokers and, and the, and the um, exchanges would know what was happening. They would treat them as legitimate orders and have all these sell orders. By the way, something like this happened by accident a couple of years ago with night trading. And nobody could find the kill switch. Uh, that firm almost went out of business, lost $450 million in a matter of hours because their computers went on autopilot and started putting in all these uh, all these sell orders. So, so you could do something like that. It wouldn't be that difficult. The FBI and Department of Homeland Security found a Russian attack virus inside the NASDAQ operating system in 2010. Uh, nice job. They disabled it, but who knows how many other viruses are lurking in there. So that's one more reason to have gold. Uh, it's not digital. You can't hack it. You can't erase it. Uh, other markets can go crazy, but your gold will preserve your wealth. Jim, we only have time for one last question. You've written quite a bit about China in your strategic intelligence newsletter, and you predicted accurately that by amassing gold, China would win itself a seat at the IMF table. So tell us a little bit about the different psychology people have regarding gold in Asian countries, particularly China and India, versus how gold is viewed in the West. Well, it's a really good question, and it goes back to what I said earlier about um, Western elites being miseducated. Again, for someone who's, um, you know, closer to, uh, uh, you know, the 60s or 70s or who has spent decades as a monetary scholar, someone like Ben Bernanke, they get gold. They just won't talk about it. Greenspan's another example. You know, Greenspan had nice things to say about gold before he was Fed chairman. And he's had nice things to say about gold since he left as Fed chairman. But during the uh, the 20 plus years that he was the Fed chairman, he, he didn't say anything nice about gold. So it shows you a little bit how, how that system works. But um, uh, there really is a, uh, uh, you know, what I would call this education gap and, the, and people don't really understand it. But that does not seem to be as prevalent overseas. You know, I travel around the world quite a bit. I, I speak and uh, do consulting on, on five continents. And I do find that uh, Asians, uh, in particular, um, Indians and Chinese, and also others, you know, go to Malaysia uh, and other places, they do understand gold a lot better. They haven't been as, uh, I'll, I'll use the word, brainwashed or miseducated as Westerners. That will work to our disadvantage because uh, I think the U.S. should be buying gold. I think the U.K. should be buying gold, uh, particularly if they leave the European Union. We'll see how that Brexit vote turns out on June 23rd. But uh, to me, it would be a little scary to leave the EU and not have gold. Uh, which the UK doesn't. They only have 300 tons, which is, um, you know, uh, I mean, Greece has 100 tons. It's, of course, it's in hock to the European Central Bank. But uh, at least on paper, Greece has 100 tons. The UK has 300 tons. Yet, you know, Greece is a tiny economy and the UK is the world's fifth largest economy. So they don't have enough gold to supply. They seem not to be worried about that. Uh, I would be very concerned if I were they. But uh, it, it's a great question. And I, I do attribute it to uh, what I'll call the propaganda of the PhDs. Well, Jim Rickards, his newsletter with Agora Financial is called Strategic Intelligence. I can personally say it's excellent. His book, which I've read parts of, is The New Case for Gold, a Penguin Portfolio book. Just came out in 2016. Check it out. Jim Rickards, thanks so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.